You, thank you. And take your seats, that'd be great. I think the, the youth are going out to their groups for the first time in a long time, so hope you have a blessed time, guys. It's good to see you here today. Um, so today we start off a series. We are starting a series on the life of Jesus um, from the book of Mark. And so it's a great privilege for me to come and just kick us off um, and to look uh, through this. If you are a note-taking person, it might be worth having your pad and pen ready. Um, if you haven't got one here today, unfortunate, um, you can watch it back and take notes. Uh, if you're home, you can go and get one. Um, there's a lot to get through um, in the passage, and I want to do it justice. Um, so let me... I'm going to read through the whole passage that I'm, I'm looking at today, which is the book of Mark, chapter 1. I'm doing verses 1 to 15. Um, and what I want you to do as I read through the scripture for the first time, I want you to really have ears to hear the phrases and the words that are being said because um, they're really purposeful. They're not just any old words, but I believe Mark um, was writing them for a purpose. Um, which might be obvious, but let's really hear what he's saying. So let's read and let's pray first. Just give us ears to hear, Lord. Give us an openness to what your spirit is speaking today. Lord, we want to know you. We want to see you. Lord, I thank you for what's about to come. <laughs> and then, amen. And that's not because of me. It's because of his word. It's because of who he is. I'm, I'm grateful for him today, Lord. So let's read. Oh, you know when you find a bit of popcorn in your teeth from yesterday and it's like really annoying? <laughs> um, Mark it says, chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my message before your face messenger before your face who will prepare your way the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make his paths straight John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around the waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized, baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Amen. Okay, so hopefully some of that which we've just read, as I look through other things, other scriptures, will resonate, and you can see the interconnectedness of God's story. And I don't know if you remember, uh, quite uh, probably about six months ago or so now, I preached on kind of this, the picture of God throughout the scriptures and how God has a story that he's outworking and, and there are different parts of it. And we must realise that all of scripture is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's about the revelation of Jesus Christ. So... Um, who was Mark? Just to give a bit of context, Mark um, was, he's not mentioned pretty much elsewhere apart from when he goes uh, on mission trips with Paul and with Silas and Luke. Um, but it's thought that Mark was somehow connected with Peter. 
And so when we're reading the Gospel of Mark, uh, really it's thought that Mark was basically Peter's scribe. Maybe Peter wasn't very good at writing or something like that. Uh, but Mark was, would get his information from Peter. And so in some respects, although we're saying it's the Gospel of Mark, it's almost, we could say it's the Gospel of Peter as well. And so that's where Mark got his information from. And as we read through Mark as well, we realise Mark is very much to the point. It's a punchy gospel. It's, it's, he uses the word immediately quite a lot. Uh, and this passage in particular is kind of the introduction to what's about to come. Which I, I was only actually given verses um, 12 to 15, but I wanted to do the whole bit. Because it, this is the introduction of what's going to come and what other people are going to share on in the coming weeks. And so Mark is setting the stage for the next part of this story because in verse 1 he says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so if we think about the context of this story and where we come to in this point of history, we, we actually have to link back to Isaiah. And there's a great correlation between what Mark is saying here in the book of Isaiah. And so if you know the book of Isaiah, um, Isaiah is a prophet in the Old Testament and he speaks to the children of Israel at a time when they, they just turned their backs on God and he, in the first book of, part of his book he basically says how the, the Babylonians are going to come and they're going to conquer you, they're going to exile you and it, you know, this is not going to be very good for you. And that's how he, he, he speaks to them. Um, and, in the, so, and we know, if you know about your history, uh, through biblical history, you know that when they go into exile in Babylon, and then later on God used the Syrians to bring them back into the land. But even after that, you have the Macedonians led by Alexander the Great who comes into Israel and conquers them. And then you have the, the Romans, and you also have these other kind of uh, dynasties and kings who rise up here and there. And even at this point where Mark is, you've got the Herods who are the kings, and so you've had this period of, of at least five, 600 years of kind of turmoil and exile and being oppressed and conquered. But God was speaking into it. Isaiah spoke into that situation. He even used the name of the person who would liberate them, um, even though that was over 100 years away. Um, and I loved it. I was reading it yesterday, and he, he says things like, you don't even know me, but I'm going to use you. You know, I love it. Anyway, that's not my sermon. Um, and so imagine you're in this position as the children of Israel. You've been conquered, you've been defeated, you've been oppressed. And, and even the point they call these the silent years. For 300 years, it's like God has not spoken. There's no prophets. There's nothing happening. But the thing is, though, what Isaiah spoke in the second part of his book he spoke about what was also then to come. He spoke about a servant of God who would come, who would be the redeemer of Israel. If you want to turn, well, I'm going to use a lot of scriptures so you can watch them on the screen. But Isaiah 43, and this is a scripture you might know very well. He says in verse 18, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honour me, the jackals and the ostrich, for I will give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drinks to my chosen people, the people who I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. So again, remember, you've come out of this place where it's all terrible and God's speaking to them about what's to come. And he says, do not remember the former things. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Think about Mark now. We are in a time of transition. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Um, so Mark again says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, hopefully you know by now the, what the word gospel means. It means good news. And so this is the beginning of the good news 
of Jesus Christ. And this is not the first time we hear about good, good news. So again, you might want to keep your finger in Isaiah if you do want to kind of go back and forth. Isaiah 52. I gave most of these today to put up, so hopefully you can see it. It says, Isaiah 52, verse 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who brings the gospel, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And so the idea of this concept of good news was ultimately about the coming of a king. So when maybe a battle was won, they'd come back and declare the good news. If a new king was coming, they'd declare the good news of what was about to come. This king was coming. And so again, when Mark says, in the beginning of the gospel, he's saying, he's, again, to the readers at that time, they would know there's good news. There's good news about a new king, a new kingdom that is coming. They would have resonated back to the prophet Isaiah who was saying there's going to become one whose feet are blessed because he will bring good news for us. And it's this new thing. So again, and so who is coming? So it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah, the anointed one, the servant of God that has been spoken of for centuries past, the one who is going to come and redeem Israel, take it out of this terrible place that it's in and move it into a new place, the, the new thing that God is doing. There is the one who is coming, and Mark is saying that one is here, and this is his story. Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God. Um, I don't know if you remember in, in uh, the scriptures, there's a parable, and it's called the parable of the tenants. And it's where uh, Jesus tells it to the Pharisees, which is basically, he says this story, which is slapping them in the face, uh, which they didn't like. Um, and he says that there was a landowner, and he, land, he, he rented out the land to uh, some tenants, and they, when he went to collect the rent, he sent his servants to collect the rent, and they basically beat the servants. And in this picture, the servants were the prophets. And he says, the prophets came and they gave this message, but you rejected them. And in the parable, at the, the end, this landover thinks, well, I'll send my son, because surely they'll pay him. And, and the, the tenants thought, here comes the son, let's kill him. And so Jesus gives this picture that you rejected the prophets, but now God has sent the son and you will reject him, which they did. Hello. Yep. So the son has now come. Um, it also says, if you read in Hebrews, and just to let you know, I don't apologise for this, but there is a lot of scripture because I think it's so important that we see the interconnectedness of what God is doing. It's not just a nice story. It's a, it's a history. It's a completeness of God. So Hebrews, chapter one. Verse 1 to 4, it says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So he's saying this is not the same as it was. This is not just another prophet, because there are a lot of religions in the world who believe Jesus is just another prophet. Just as Moses was, now there's another prophet whose name is Jesus. And he is saying, no, this is not another prophet. This is the son who has come. It says, who he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. So who is this guy? He is the heir of all things. Everything is going to be his. Everything. He is the one who created all things. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So he's the same and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is the one we're talking about. He holds everything in his hands. He, he holds the universes in his, in his word. It's all held together. 
It says, after making purification for sins, this is the spoiler alert that's going to come later in Mark, but he makes purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So he's not even an angel, he's greater, he's greater, he is the son. The son has come. This is what we're looking to. Okay. So we read on in, um, back in Mark now. <laughs> it says, as is written in verse 2, the, in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. I just want to go back into Isaiah to kind of reference, read that passage. And it's in Isaiah chapter 40. Because again, I just think it gives a richness. And you remember that whenever in the scriptures, when the gospels, when Jesus might quote an Old Testament passage, he might only quote a small bit, and maybe that's all that they recorded, maybe he did more. But the idea is, in your mind, you're supposed to then go back and go, oh, what was that about? Because obviously for the Jewish people who knew the scriptures, probably a lot maybe better than us, they would have been like, oh, oh, he's referring to Isaiah. He's referring to that whole passage. He's not just picking out a verse, but he's talking about the whole thing. So again, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level. The rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So all this is coming. The, the messenger is coming to prepare the way, to make it straight, to make it flat, to raise up, to bring down, to make it straight so that the glory of the Lord is revealed. Jump over to John chapter 1, verse 14, and it says, And the word became, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory so the word came and was dwelt among us. So we have seen the glory of God when we see the word of God. Jesus Christ is the glory of God. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the, the, the messenger has come to prepare a way to make the path straight so the glory can be seen. Who is the glory? The glory is, the Jesus, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it's interesting as well that Jesus said, he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because they were saying, God, Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father. We, we need to see the Father. And he said, no, no look, look at me. Because if you see me, you see the full glory of God. I think it's interesting, again, that the messenger comes to prepare the way for the one to come. And I don't know how you feel, whether you would know yourself as a, a messenger of God, but we, we are all ambassadors of Christ. If you are a Christian, you are an ambassador of Christ. And I believe this is a word for each of us, that your purpose is to prepare the way for the king. And, and in many respects, to do so, we have to realise it's about his glory and not our own. Because the moment it becomes about us, then obstacles start being put in the way of others seeing God's glory. And John said this, and you, uh, we've said this many times, that John said, I must decrease that he might increase. John knew he must get out the way. Now, that's not to say that there will never be famous Christians. There will be, there are. There are many saints we, we, we love and we look back on and we celebrate their lives, we learn from them. But if your objective as a believer is to be known, then you will become an obstacle to the purpose of God. God might make you known, but that should not be your objective.
So again, when you put your videos up on YouTube, if they get likes, glory to God. I can say that as a YouTuber. I just think it's great that God will exalt you and you don't have to worry about it. You have to be worry about being faithful. You have to worry about being obedient. And if you are, then he will take you where you need to be. I don't think John ever meant to be famous. He was just doing his thing. And in some respects, he did everything to not be famous. As we read on, it says that he was out in the wilderness. You know, it's like, well, if you want to be famous, you want to be in Jerusalem, you know, in the city, in the temple. If you want to be famous, you don't wear weird things and eat wild locusts and honey and be that, that. It's funny, in the, if you watch The Chosen, they refer to him as Weird John. <laughs> it's like, this guy should not be famous. But because he carried the Spirit of God, he was, he, he was renowned. Okay. And so we read on in uh, verse 4, it says, John appeared... And again, just to clarify, just in case anyone doesn't know, we maybe take these things for granted. There are two Johns in the New Testament. There is a John, the Baptist. He was not in the Baptist church. He was the baptizer. He baptized people. Um, as you again, spoiler alert, he gets killed pretty soon. Um, there's another John who was the disciple of Jesus, often referred to as the one who Jesus loved. That was a self-appointed title he gave himself. Um, and he was the, the gospel writer and the writer in the epistles. So there's two Johns, and this is John the baptizer, who was the second cousin of Jesus, as we read in other uh, passages. So John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So he was, he was a popular guy. And it's very interesting that they were coming out and being baptised. And, and we're very familiar, maybe, with this story. But as I was studying this, it got me thinking, why was John baptising people? I don't know if you've ever thought that. Maybe you are now, for the first time. Why was John baptising people? Because what should they have done for the forgiveness of sins in this day and age? Now, they should have gone to the temple take their sacrifice, the priest would have taken the sacrifice and declared them cleansed, declared them good with God. That was the system that was in place. And Jesus even said to people at times, okay, go and make your sacrifice. So there was that system in place. And so it got me thinking, why is John doing this? Why is God doing this in John? And so I did a bit of research and couldn't find any satisfactory answer. Um, so I came up with my own. Um, there you go. It sounds good in my mind. So I'm going to share it with you, and obviously, hopefully it sounds good to you as well. Why did John baptise? And so what we realise, again, what is happening here is, is setting the scene for what is to come. What John is, is like the warm-up man. That's how I see him. You know, like you get the warm-up act, at a better, if you go to a concert, and then you have the main act, and you have another group that comes on just to get everyone warmed up while people are coming you know they're not quite ready yet and so you have a warm-up band and that's kind of almost how I see John and that's not to say that Jesus couldn't have just come and done it but John was preparing the way and what John marked was a transition from the old to the new because Jesus says John was the greatest of the prophets but John was an old testament prophet he was the last of the prophets. And what we see is the transformation or transfer from this old system to a new system. And part of that, as we realise now, was that the temple, as they knew it, was doomed. 70, probably from this point, if I do my maths, about 40 years later, the temple was destroyed. So they had all their hope in this sacrificial system, and yet... Here was John saying there's something different is going to be coming. He was like alluding to something new. The temple system was being done away. Equally, we must realise that the religious system of that day, I believe, was not cut out for what it was supposed to be doing. Often, 
in religious, and we can do this today, we can be just the same. We can go through the motions. We can box tick. We can say, yep, doing this, doing this, made my sacrifice, done my offering, given my money, said my prayers, I'm good. And there's a danger often in religious societies that you just go through the motions of box ticking so that you can say, I'm good. Uh, a few books back, in Malachi, in the Old Testament, Malachi really slams the children of Israel for saying, you're bringing these unacceptable sacrifices. Because again, they were like, you know, we're going through the motions, we're doing what we should do. But what they were doing, they were bringing like the worst lamb to sacrifice. It was like, okay, I've got to make a sacrifice. Which one? That one doesn't look like he's going to make it till the end of the week. We'll sacrifice that one. And, so the, and God was just like, your sacrifices are an abomination to me. I'm not interested. And think about also how Jesus uh, talked about this age. Something he referred to the Pharisees, he said to, about them, you honour me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. He said, you're like a whitewashed sepulchre, which means you're all about the outside, like a tomb, but inside you're dead. That's what he meant by that. If you think about when Jesus went into the temple, what did he do? He didn't go, oh, this is a lovely place. He said, no, you've turned my, the father's house into a den of thieves, of robbers, because they were, there was extortion going on, they were manipulating people. So he went in with a whip. That's gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He went in with a whip and he turned over the tables. The system was broken. It needed something different. I think there's also a recognition for true repentance. It reminded me of David, and this just came to me when I was studying this, in Psalm 51, a famous psalm after David uh, cheated with Bathsheba and killed her husband Uriah. And it says, in his, this is his psalm of repentance, his Psalm 51, verse 16 and 17, it says, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. They were, they were going through the motions, they were ticking the boxes, they were making their sacrifices in a broken system. But God was doing something new. He was about to bring in a new thing, and transform everything. And to do so, something had to be different in the hearts of the people. And so John was calling them to baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. I think as well, John was building this bridge to a new thing. So Jesus was going to come and bring a new thing. And John was kind of introducing this concept of baptism for forgiveness of sins. It was quite a novel. They were used to kind of cleansing rituals, things like that, but they weren't really used to this. And that's why maybe it just was standing out so much. Because, again, what we realise is he was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but then when Jesus came, he preached the f repentance for the forgiveness of sins and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so again, John was like, okay, for some of you, this step to what Jesus is going to bring is too big. Let me create a little step for you to step on so that when Jesus comes, you, can, you know what he's talking about. So in all of these things, John was preparing the way. Now read on in uh, verse 9 about the baptism of Jesus. It says, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn upon and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Again, so you think, well, what's going on here? Why did Jesus need to come and be baptised? This is the Son of God, the Messiah. He should be the one paving the way. I actually, what I believe is it, again, it was kind of this, it's not, Jesus wasn't being baptised for the forgiveness of sins. I believe he was being baptised to initiate a new thing. And again, if you go back into Isaiah, 
This is Isaiah 42, verse 1. So in Isaiah 42, verse 1, it says, Behold my servant. So again, you think Jesus is coming out of the water. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. So again, when you've got this baptism, I believe it's kind of this, again, it, It's saying, look back to what was spoken. Look back. This is the servant of God that Isaiah spoke about. This is the one who God is sending to transform everything. I'm going to put my spirit upon him. And it's not that Jesus didn't have the spirit already, but I believe in the sense, elsewhere we hear about the spirit can act like a seal. And I believe in this sense, the spirit was kind of just bringing a confirmation, a sealing to the work of God and what this was, what was about to happen. And so you have this, the baptism of Jesus. And so then we go on to the temptation of Jesus. So it says, the spirit, this is in verse 12 of Mark, the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Okay, so we have this picture that Jesus is out in the wilderness. And so we learn elsewhere that he was fasting and that he was tempted by Satan in three different ways. You can read that elsewhere. But I want you to compare this moment to when another time the serpent came to tempt. Back in the Garden of Eden, contrast these two scenarios. We think back in the Garden of Eden, you've got this idyllic, perfect setting. It was lush, it was green, everything was growing, everything was good. Adam and Eve were there just enjoying being together in the the fellowship with God. Everything was right. Contrast this to the wilderness. Now it's not necessarily a desert, this was a barren place. It was dry, it was dusty, it was kind of, um, yeah, just there wasn't much growing. In the Garden of Eden, what were the animals? The animals were all friendly. <laughs> Adam had named them all. You know, you get this picture, they're all lying around together, not killing each other or anything like that, whereas Jesus was in the place with wild animals. I don't know if you cottoned on that one of the verses I read in Isaiah, it said about the wild animals as well. But anyway, a little connection. Um, and so you've got these two very contrasting situations. In the first instance they had it all but it was all thrown away it was all lost this oneness with God this relationship with God the the perfection of man in that sense the sinlessness of man was all lost and the authority was handed over to the enemy and I believe in this moment in this passage when Jesus went through this Jesus is taking it back Jesus said, everything that was lost in the garden, I'm taking it back. This is the turning. This is the new thing. This is the turnaround that's going to happen. And I believe the enemy comes and he's like, he know, you know, like a boxer when they're going down and they, it's one last swing. But he's like, I've got to try at least. I'm going to tempt Jesus. And it's interesting that the temptations of Jesus were to say, because again, there was nothing that Jesus was tempted with that was wrong. Food. The nations. Because the nations were going to be his. Everything that was, he was being tempted with were things that were promised to him. The protection of the Father, if you know. It says, throw yourself down off the temple. Yeah, he was protected by the angels. He was due the nations. But the difference of where it was coming from because Jesus would receive these things from the Father, whereas Satan was saying, will you receive these things from me? So he wanted to establish his authority, keep his authority, and Jesus was like not having any of it. He resisted the temptation. He's saying, I am doing a new thing. 
Because actually, if you think about this idea that you had, and it talks about Jesus as the second Adam. You had the first Adam through whom sin came into the world. And now you have the new Adam who is going to conquer sin and death and bring forgiveness of sins and life. And this is who we're talking about. Is that good? Yeah? Yeah? Anyone happy about that? (laughs) I appreciate you're not allowed to say anything, are you? Just go, yeah. Um, It's also interesting that you've got this idea of 40 days. He was in the wilderness 40 days. He was fasting. There's another 40 days in the Old Testament where Moses is up on the mountain for 40 days fasting, and in this time, he's given the, new, the old covenant. The covenant of Moses is given to him. The Ten Commandments is given to him. So again, there's something very symbolic here that Jesus is in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and initiating a new covenant. From this comes the new covenant, the new kingdom of Jesus. Nearly there. So you go on into verse 14. It says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So John, again, John had to decrease. He was arrested so Jesus could increase. He had to get out of the way. And that meant him being arrested. It's interesting that Jesus came into Galilee. If you look back a page in your Bible into Matthew, and if you remember, I preached on this a few weeks ago, where did Jesus tell them to go after the resurrection? These little things interest me. He said, go to Galilee. I find it interesting that Jesus ended in Galilee, but he also starts in Galilee. Just interesting. But he's proclaiming the good news Again, he's proclaiming the gospel, the good news of God, that there is a new king. And saying the time is fulfilled. So everything that has been leading up to this point, everything up to now, now is the time of fulfillment. And it says in Romans 5, verse 6, it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know, God is all about the right time. He's never late. He's never early. He's always on time. It's always the right time. And you think, well, why didn't Jesus come earlier? I don't know. But this was a time. This is a fulfillment of all that had been spoken all that they had been waiting for, all that the prophet Isaiah had said, all that the prophet Daniel had said, if interesting, if you want to get into really interesting things, in Daniel, it basically predicts the year of the coming of Jesus, uh, if you want to get into that. But again, everything they had said was coming now. And imagine, again, put yourself in their position. Everything was bad. The Romans were there. The Macedonians have been there before. The Babylonians before them. God hasn't, wasn't speaking yet. We were waiting for this one to come who was going to deliver us, who was going to redeem us, who was going to bring us hope and a new kingdom. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so this idea of repentance, we've, you've probably had many sermons about repentance and they say, It's about changing direction, a turnabout. But I want you to grasp, everything had to change. There had to be a transformation because you cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless there is a turning about, a complete 180, complete, everything needs to be changed. And often we might think, I want to enter into God's kingdom because when you read about all the promises, you're like, wow, this sounds really good. There's joy, there's happiness, there's peace, there's prosperity. You know, all these wonderful things. Yeah, I want all those things. And this is the kingdom of God. Because he is the king. But you can only enter into the kingdom of God if there is a change in you. You cannot 
bring the, mix the old and the new. We, we read that again later on, if you think about the new wineskins, he says you cannot put new wine in old wineskins. There's got to be something new. God is doing a new thing. And the new king has arrived. And if you want to get on board with the new king, you need to switch your thinking. You need to change it up. And you need to say, I am going to do it his way. This is the time. The kingdom of God is at hand. And I believe when we think about the kingdom of God, it's because it was being ushered in. Because what we realize, there is a kingdom to come. There is still a new kingdom to come in Christ where everything is fulfilled. Everything kind of is complete. It's all wrapped up. We're in this in-between phase now where we are, there is a kingdom. It's not of this world. We are in that kingdom. And so we need to say it's not about what I want anymore. It's not about what I think as he said, forget the former things. I'm going to bring you into a new thing. And I think the new... Uh, I had a really good point. Yeah. I've lost it. There's a transformation happening and it's not about places. It's not about so it's not about the temple anymore. It's not about Jerusalem anymore. It's about him and he is going to be with us and the king has come. The new king is here. And so, again, this is the introduction. This is setting the stage to say everything that you've been waiting for, it is now. The time has come. The one you have been waiting for, he is the king of glory, as we were just singing. He is the king of glory. He is the Son of God. He is the servant of God who is going to come and redeem us. And the good news is it's not just about Israel. It's not just a message for Israel 2,000 years ago for the fulfillment of them. It's a message because, again, it says he will come for the nations. It's interesting, again, to think that one can come that you never knew you were waiting for. Because Israel were waiting, no, no one else was waiting for Jesus. They weren't like, but they knew they needed something. And maybe even for us, whether you're here or whether you're watching online, you didn't know that you lacked. But Jesus is saying, I'm here to bring the fulfillment of my promise, the fullness of my kingdom, and you are invited into it. Just to sum up, couple of things, I think. Just say, if you are an ambassador of God, if you are a messenger of God, I want to encourage you to make the way clear for him. We can be very good at putting obstacles in the way of things. Let's make the way clear. Let's proclaim him. If you're not in the kingdom, but you want to be, what change needs to happen in you? Because we don't just want a box ticking. It's not like, what change? Well, I'm going to come to church more regularly. I'm going to have a prayer time in the morning. I'm going to read my Bible every day. Those things are all good, but that is not the sacrifice that God is looking for. He's looking for a broken heart, a broken spirit. He said, I need to change your heart. And that is, and I don't know if you can even grasp this. I think it's a really hard thing to grasp. Your whole thinking needs to be switched. Because naturally, in our sinful state, we think of ourselves. That's what we do. We think of ourselves. And God is saying, no, it's about my glory. So will you now repent and believe? And that will be the way into God. Amen. I'm just going to worship God and uh, sing. And again, we want to just glorify him because of who he is. And I hope as we do the series, challenge yourself not to just be over-familiar with the stories that we go into. Again, hopefully realising, wow, this is 
This is the new king. This is a new kingdom. What does that mean for me now? Amen.